afternoon, everyone from Cambridge. I hope everyone is staying safe and staying well. So as mentioned, my name is Mark Bray, and I'm a data scientist at Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. And it's my privilege for Dennis and my colleague Dennis and I to be presenting on behalf of our team um, on our use of the AWS platform for high content screening and data analysis. Uh, but first, a quick overview of the presentation contents. So I will be starting off uh, giving the background of the problem at hand in high content screening. Um, and after that, after that short intro, I will turn things over to Dennis and he will take you all on a, on a deep dive into the infrastructure that we used and the usage of AWS components. And then finally, he will wrap up with um, what we learned from the entire experience. So at Novartis, um, we are in the business of um, researching and developing and bringing much needed medicines to patients for a wide variety of diseases. And I guess, as you might imagine, in the midst of a pandemic, um, all eyes are definitely on not just Novartis, but uh, the pharmaceutical industry in general for a solution to the crisis that we're currently in. Um, however, the open secret in the field is that uh, just to bring a single drug to market, including R&D, clinical trials, and the like, it can cost over well over a billion dollars and take an excess of of 10 years um, at least. That's a long time, and that's definitely a lot of money. <laughs> so anything that can shorten the time and cost of this drug pipeline um, can safely be considered a, a win. And that's actually not just true at the kind of high macro level, but also at sort of the micro level, the sort of boots on the ground level. Um, part of my responsibility, I would say as a data scientist, is in large part um, chaperoning the so-called big data um, from where it's generated, the raw data, um, over to the biologists so they can get along in their business of generating hypotheses and collecting results for drug discovery. So furthermore, the closer we can get the biologists to the data at hand, to the data itself, um, essentially lowering the bar of entry, um, the greater the scientific impact will be. So to that end, I'll be showing you a, um, you know, this will be basically a vignette of um, this approach as it relates to applying um, machine learning um, to the business of cell-based assays for drug discovery. So here, um, this is an overview of what the, um, uh, what we're using um, drug discovery to actually do. So in this case, for, um, we take cells and place them into essentially a um, small micro well plate. Um, each of these plates contains essentially a bucket, a small well, which contains a, a collection of cells, say about a thousand cells per well. Um, each of these cells may be taken from a patient with a disease or um, from an animal model that um, represents a disease state. Um, once these cells are put in the well, we then treat them with um, a set of chemicals or compounds from our library. Libraries often over you know, a million compounds at least, in the hope that at least um, one or several of these compounds will succeed in reversing the disease state of the cell and basically bring it back to something sub, uh, something closer to a healthy healthy uh, cell, and hence um, something closer to a healthy patient. Um, we then take we use um, automated microscopy to go well by well and essentially uh, taking pictures of these cells in the well. Now, what we've done to these cells is fluorescently label them or tag them such that when they're excited with light, um, certain the entire cell or certain parts of the cell light up. This is essentially what we're taking um, pictures of. The idea is that um, by labeling these parts of the cell and then taking measurements of the fluorescent labels that we see, um, we can essentially capture what's called the phenotype, essentially the cellular um, behavior, how the cell is acting um, at a given time in a given state. The phenotype of, of cell that's diseased is hopefully different than a cell that's healthy. And we can hopefully capture this by collecting measurements of the cell, which is shown using this barcode over on the right. So the idea here is that each cell essentially acts as its own mini experiment. And we do what is called phenotypic screening by using the cell as essentially the context for drug discovery. And so this is where um, 
multi-parametric data analysis comes in. That is actually the name of the platform that we have developed. MPDA is what we call it for short. And essentially what it is, is providing cellular data analysis at scale for biologists. It's intended to be an easy to use web app that is placed in front of the biologists. It enables iterative analysis capabilities. So the biologists can um, go through a workflow, make adjustments, go back and review the um, what their changes does to the results. Um, it can support an arbitrary and large number of readouts. These measurements that I was describing on a previous slide, um, these readouts can be say 10 to 100, but possibly even thousands of readouts per cell um, describing something about the phenotype of the cell. Now, initially, this was done for a well-level data analysis. In other words, each of these readouts were collected at the from all the cells in a well, but then averaged to the well level um, to get a kind of aggregate measure. Um, but subsequently, we found a, a need for single cell analysis as well, drilling down to the detail, to the granular detail of the single cell. And so that was enabled as well. So this presentation will go over just some of the challenges we faced, the benefits that came out of this, and an overview of how MPDA was actually built. And to make things easier, so this was our first experience at Niver in porting this sort of stack to um, AWS Cloud. Um, but this was definitely not just a simple port as we were um, building functionality to the software at the same time to process data sets that were much bigger than what had been processed before. So a lot of these uh, components were being put into place for the first time, lots of moving parts, um, the phrase, you know, fixing the plane while, um, you know, while driving it is, is definitely applicable here. And so as far as the user community and uh, usage patterns, so again, as I've mentioned, the users for MPD are biologists who are, as, who are analyzing their um, fluorescent phenotypic assays in order to generate hypotheses for drug discovery. We have um, several hundred users across several sites, not just in Cambridge, but also in Switzerland and Emeryville and elsewhere. The assay results can actually range quite a bit in size um, from just a few um, megabytes of, of data to several terabytes of data easily. And the idea is that the users trigger the data analysis with the MPDA UI. And with that, the backend needs to basically go from zero to 60 starting from a cold start to um, possibly running multiple analysis just within a matter of minutes. And at that point, the users will explore the data, change their um, calculation parameters, and then rerun and examine um, how their assay is doing, what the analysis results are. So this is kind of summarized here in terms of the workflow. Over on the left, we have the microscopes, the actual instruments that are doing the data capture itself. Um, once you really have the images, the plates are registered. So there's associated experimental metadata that is attached to these images um, and also other um, microscope data as well. And all of this goes into an image analysis platform, which is also AWS driven to go from um, images coming in to the readouts and measurements coming out on the other end. These readouts are then fed into MPDA um, and then once the analysis is done, the biologist has moved things along to where um, results can be gathered. This can then be deposited into a data store or data lake. So just a quick overview of what the data actually looks like. So I've mentioned all these different readouts that can be collected across um, different cells, but what does that actually look like? Um, it can come in two forms. As I said before, the well level measurement, um, a bunch of cells in a well, um, that data gets output essentially as a flat file, a, a CSV file in which each row of the CSV corresponds to one well. And each of the columns corresponds to the experimental metadata plus the measurements as, as additional uh, columns. Moving on to the single cell level, um, in that case, um, the same sort of thing for columns, metadata plus measurements, but in that case, one row represents one cell's worth of data. So you can imagine that for thousands of cells per well, this can get rather um, large very quickly. So at the well level data, what do we, what is the biologist actually presented with? Well, they have um, several different um, um, flavors of the UI that they can see, um, ranging from data analysis, visualizing this Im these images. So these are all microscopy images, and it's very important for the biologist to be able to see these um, different phenotypes and not just simply a table of numbers. Um, 
in addition to this, there's also um, data reporting that needs to happen as well. So as far as um, uh, different displays, MPDA has a series of different visualizations ranging from heat maps that show um, at a um, broad 1,000-foot um, you know, overview of the plate and the associated data. You also have box plots to show the distribution of the data. Um, correlations that kind of show like how these different readouts um, um, trend with each other, as well as uh, measurement importance, which of these readouts are mo most important in contributing to the phenotype at hand. Once the user has kind of gone, has had a chance to peruse these um, various readouts, then they will go down and, and um, deem what they call hits. Um, which of these wells correspond to a treatment which um, deliver the phenotype that is of interest um, versus the ones that don't. And one of the final steps of MPDA is offering several hit, so-called hit analysis methods, ranging from how of distance, which is kind of a tried and true one in the statistics world, um, and also other sort of um, machine learning based uh, types of hit, um, hit calling methods. All of these are provided to the user along with documentation on how and how and when to best use them. Um, so that's at the well level, but as I mentioned earlier, we had a need for single cell data as well. Um, the idea, um, it would be nice that if each well had exactly the same type of cells or they all acted the same way upon treatment with a uh, chemical compound. But since this is real life, that's usually not the case. Um, you can have um, several different phenotypes, several different subpopulations represented in a single well. Some of these phenotypes and cells are interesting, others are not. Some may be just simply dead or some sort of noise. You want to get rid of those. Um, so the downside of that is by taking all this rich data and collapsing it to a single well-level measure, you may end up kind of washing away some of these interesting phenotypes. So in this case, it's better to go down to the single cell level and start looking at some per cell distributions that belong to, the, to a given phenotype. And so that's when the uh, where the single cell level workflow comes in. And so this is a additional part of the workflow that is added on at the front end of the well level um, workflow. Here, data is loaded, and there's also QC quality control that can be done on the single cell level. Um, there's correction normalization that can be done. Objects can also be classified, and I'll get to that in um, a couple slides in. And then um, once the classification is to which phenotypes are of interest. Um, once that's done, then those results can be aggregated to the um, well level, and you can continue on with the analysis down to the hit calling uh, portion. So for classification, you know, what is an interesting cell and versus what is not? There are two approaches that are given. One is an image-based um, so-called supervised learning approach versus gating, where if you have just a couple of readouts, you can basically kind of box off a, um, a set of cells that are of interest from a 2D plot. Um, but what we've found to be, or at least what I found to be um, very um, empowering and enabling is this uh, single cell image classification mode, where again, the same things are, um, you, aspects of the UI are offered to the biologist, analysis, visualization, reporting. Um, but here, the biologist is given um, actual pictures of the cells themselves, which they can then classify to say, oh, these cells come from, are belong to this phenotype of interest versus these other cells that do not. And then once they've created their so-called training set, um, cells that belong to these different buckets, then a class, a, um, say a random force classifier can be run that beyond the back end um, comes up with a way to classify the cells into these phenotypes. And then once the classifier achieves the desired accuracy, this can then be turned loose on the entire experimental data set consisting of tens of millions of, of cells based on a training set of just a few. So that's the basic overview of um, the use cases at hand. And so at this point, I will turn it over to Dennis to take it from here. Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Beautiful. Um, I am having some video issues. So unfortunately, I'm unable to render video. And I'm also having some networking issues at home. So I'll just do audio for now. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Dennis Kutreiber. I'm an associate director for the Nibber Informatics Cloud team. I've been with Nibber for roughly five years. My role within the team is to provide cloud infrastructure services to all my customers, Mark being one of them. 
while ensuring that they enjoy the full benefits of um, what Cloud has to offer. To date, we have about 450 Amazon accounts in commission with hundreds of users accessing uh, our cloud platform on a daily basis. We operate within multiple AWS regions, three to four, uh, mainly in US East One, with a very robust AWS Direct Connect uh, network with Transit Gateway backend, uh, where uh, amidst uh, transferring from virtual interface hosting to Direct Connect. So let's uh, get to the point at hand. Within this line, I'm going to go over the major architectural components of MPDA hosting. On the left column, uh, we have a pipeline for large data ingestion uh, with distributed computing elastic map reduced nodes, or otherwise known as EMR. Uh, this is where we analyze input data uh, that Mark talked about, and we prepare it for uh, visualization uh, to be used by the biologists. This is also where we use Spark and MLib library for machine learning. So there's a lot of machine learning happening under the hood. On the right column, we have our visualization and control engine. This is where we offer our bench scientists or biologists user interface access with interactive controls, allowing them to visualize the imported data as they see fit. Well, that, that's one of the most important requirements, right? This is also where we can render millions of data points near real time by using Apache, Cassandra, and NoSQL database engine, which believe it or not is hosted on EC2. We'll talk about Amazon managed for, um, options later. The UI itself uh, was custom built to our scientists' exact needs, and it is fully customizable, allowing them to perform plate and well masking, feature exclusions, cell classifications, calculation configurations, etc. Mark, next. Awesome. So let's talk about objectives uh, for enabling uh, multi-parametric analysis at scale. Well, there's two types of requirements. We had the business requirements coming from the uh, Novartis business unit, and we also had technical requirements. Uh, on the business front, we were asked to build an easy to use web app where biologists can enable um, iterative capabilities while allowing higher scale multi-parametric data analysis for high content screening of well data. That was the initial business requirement, well data. Remember what Mark said about cell and well, right? The second business requirement was around enabling um, the same for single cell data, which is a lot more complex, a lot bigger, while delivering quality control and visualization capabilities. And this is where the crux of the issue comes in. On the technical front, we had to address four different things. Scalability, we had to be able to both vertically and horizontally scale automatically, hopefully, right? We were asked to, um, we needed to provide the ability to import very large and very complex data sets very quickly. As you can imagine, our lab machines are on site. And this is where all these, uh, um, all, all, all the data, you know, emerges from, and then it needs to be analyzed and visualized in MPDA. So we needed a, a, a good transport mechanism and also a good analysis mechanism. Third requirement on the technical front is provide low latency for visualization and the UI interaction. So as you can imagine, as a bench scientist, you want to be able to get into your UI and be able to visualize quickly without having to wait hours, days. You don't have that time, right? And last but not least, fast job response. Near real time for small data sets and potentially hours for very big terabyte size data sets. Next. <clears throat> so what do we do in summary? Uh, what were we asked to do? What did we have to do, right? We were asked to build a custom software meeting our exact scientific scientist needs. We were also asked to seamlessly scale without there being impact or even notice of any performance degradation, right? That's one, that's an additional key. No user interaction other than on the UI front for visualization, right? Semi or full automation by using infrastructure as code, cloud formation, CI, CD, Jenkins, et cetera. And of course, choosing the right stack for the right job. This is why we ended up um, choosing Cassandra and Spark and not some other managed or non-managed piece of software. And last but not least, we were asked to aim at zero support and zero downtime. Next. 
So why Amazon Web Services? Well, before I answer this question, let's focus on what the exact needs um, that were in front of us. MPDA was initially deployed on premises for well data analysis, typically gigabytes in size. MPDA needed to scale to analyze single cell data, which was a lot more complex. Now we're talking about terabytes. Single cell data can obviously be up to thousand times bigger than well based data. And we also needed the ability to scale and scale quickly without any boundaries. And I'll talk about boundaries in a few, we did hit a few. <laughs> Not to say that Amazon isn't great, but even they have boundaries. Um, keeping on-prem environment was very difficult. And at some point we ended up with a two year old Spark version, keeping things up to date from app stack to infrastructure stack while ensuring dynamic storage expansion was a no-go. I mean, just, just imagine needing to scale your infrastructure and have to wait six months for these storage clusters to be installed, which costs millions of dollars, right? That's just storage. We have networking, we have uh, you know compute nodes, HPC, et cetera. So none of this was really um, easily attainable. And even if it was, which it wasn't, we needed to refresh this. So the life cycle of any piece of hardware typically is three to five years. So you can imagine if something goes down, we have to procure new equipment. This is why managing on-prem was a nightmare, even though it partially worked. So this is why we considered AWS. So let's talk about bit on the capacity front. We did hit a few snags on Amazon front. Um, there were numerous interventions where Amazon infrastructure team had to quickly release more compute capacity, but this was quickly mitigated, not a big deal, but we did break Amazon. Rajesh can uh, attest uh, two or three times during um, the high content screening analysis piece. All right, so let's talk about the architectural overview, right? Uh, here's the overall um, architectural diagram. On the left, we see our on-prem cluster where data instruments pipe images and get them processed to what we call a cell profiler. On the right, we see the complete MPDA stack with some obfuscations, obviously. Lambda and other stuff was obfuscated, uh, mainly uh, with EMR and Cassandra nodes, uh, which are hosted in US East 1. You also see a bunch of web servers that perform the actual visualization um, that's fed by Cassandra. We also see a few S3 buckets where the business and process data is ingested and pulled from, right? For monitoring, obviously, we're using CloudWatch and CloudTrail for logging. All right, Mark, next. All right, so what you guys just saw was something that actually worked until maybe two years ago which was what we call a hybrid approach, where the um, high content screening and data ingestion happen on-prem, and where um, analysis and visualization happen in AWS. So let's show you what the AWS native approach looks like, where high content screening analysis is actually, and cell profiler, is brought into Amazon Web Services, all right? So on the far left, you see AWS batch service. This is a Docker container um, that's launched by a batch, creating an array of jobs, and each job gets farmed out to a specific container, um, anywhere between thousands and hundreds of thousands of containers running simultaneously during a job processing uh, unit of work. When process is finished, results are written to S3, and the rest is handed over to MPDA which is the crux of this uh, meeting. What we have essentially replaced uh, in this architecture is the cell analysis and data preparation step, which was done on-premises. Data is still um, generated on the on-prem machines, but it's prepped, it's uh, analyzed and visualized in Amazon. This is where MPDA takes over. Both steps are now fully sitting behind AWS. Two different accounts, actually multiple different accounts, I'll talk about the environment in a few. Mark, next slide. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about auto scaling and um, EMR computing nodes. First, EMR is our compute cluster. It scales up and down based on need. It has auto scaling policy configured. It's semi-automatic. We're not using managed EMR scaling yet, and I'll talk about that in a few. It can serve a mix of on-demand and spot instances. It's able to add and remove nodes on the fly. Um, so that's not an issue for us. Next slide. All right, let's talk about scaling and data persistent. 
for data that users interact in the UI, data persists in Cassandra, which as I said, is an Apache NoSQL database. Cassandra works really, really well with Spark natively. So EMR, right? It's able to horizontally scale, even though we have hosted it within an EC2 um, uh, instance. So Cassandra sits on EC2, it works with EMR. And we're gonna talk about Amazon Key Spaces, which uh, is a new um, hosted Cassandra um, service, which was launched during the last reInvent. We haven't tested it yet, but we're gonna talk about it. Um, within the UI, we also make use of dynamic EBS disk expansion with a JBot setup. For large cell, and so the next step is for large terabyte single cell data that is not rendered in the UI, this data persists on S3 in form of a Parquet file. This is not rendered within the UI, as I said, um, it's using Apache Spark to um, run compute. All right, for system automation, data persists in DynamoDB, which works really well with Lambda. All right, so those are the three steps. Next, we're gonna talk about reliability, um, availability and full tolerance to be precise. So I'm gonna break this down in three, in four different tiers. First is the web app. Um, as I said, web app is hosted within EC2 instance. Uh, it's got an auto scaling group uh, with Tomcat and JavaScript running on it. Data is hosted on EC2 hosted Cassandra. So that's the, the database. This is also highly available and full tolerant, uh, order of three. So we can actually, uh, two nodes can be down and we'd still be up on the Cassandra database. Of course, it's hosted on EC2. Um, second tier here is the um, EMR, which where we run the compute. That is actually run in a single AZ. It's not highly available, but for us that's totally acceptable and we're able to, um, automate this into a different availability zone within the same region should we want to. Again, we're using Jenkins, CI, CD, and CloudFormation to launch all these different components. And of course, we're using S3, which highly available and highly durable. We're using S3 standard. Next. Cool. Now here's the really important part of this entire infrastructure, our recovery and self-healing. Um, for recovery and self-healing uh, aspects of MPDA, we have automated recovery measures, which include EC2 auto recovery, EMR node recovery, web app auto scaling, automated retries for Cassandra. So essentially we're stopping and starting Cassandra when we don't need it. Uh, when jobs are running, it can um, start up very quickly. We're also using Lambda to achieve full blue green deployments. Even when we stop and start the cluster, this is where we update EMR DNS cache um, and get everything up and running within minutes and seconds, depending on what we're launching. Cassandra is robust to node failure. I already talked about JBot and uh, replication factor of three, right? We're also using EBS uh, for Cassandra storage. Data will survive node failure. Uh, we have four volumes per Cassandra node in a JBot setup. We're also using uh, EBS uh, provision IOPS, SSD GP2 for some of the performance tuning on storage end. Next. All right, let's talk about account management. So obviously we're using IAM uh, with roles um, in place of um, access keys. We're using a tool called Turbo to manage IAM, but we could have just as well used uh, IAM uh, natively. We're using Turbo because it integrates well with, um, with our multi-account, multi-region, multi-user um, setup that we have uh, with the Nibber. We have a combination of different environments, dev test prod, we might even have a stage. Uh, MPDA resources are running within a single VPC. We don't have a multi-region tenancy. It's possible, but there's no need from a scientific HA perspective. Um, and like I said, we're using AWS and uh, IAM and Turbo for access management. Let's talk about data security next. Yeah, so what are we doing about security? Obviously security is, is, is very special um, to Werner, but also to most enterprises out there. Um, we're using encryption at rest and in transit anywhere where feasible. So for uh, S3 and EBS, we're using encryption at rest, also in transit. We're using, uh, for DynamoDB and S3, we're using gateway endpoints. I'm just gonna call them VPC endpoints. 
data is encrypted uh, when leaving the VPC, including access to on-prem Oracle database, which is needed for the UI. We're using a standard setup uh, in, in place of NACLs, we're using on-prem firewalls, which we're moving away from uh, with the transit gateway design. Uh, we're also using security groups, and for audit trail, we're using CloudTrail. No data is exposed publicly. Next slide. All right, let's talk about deployment. Um, we're using custom-built AMIs off of on-prem um, custom AMIs, what we call NX Core. These are automated uh, by using Chef, and these are replaced by means of blue-green deployment by using CloudFormation stack sets and templates, which many of you are using, of course. So everything is pretty much baked into the AMI, and we're just using automation to secure a better deployment. Next, let's talk about the automation itself. For automation, as mentioned, uh, for EMR and Cassandra, we're using CloudFormation stack sets and CloudFormation templates. For web app and AMI deployments, we're using CloudFormation and Chef. Let's talk about security. Next. Of course, I mentioned we're using IAM roles uh, with predefined uh, um, access. We're using least privileged access. Multiple accounts, pretty standard. Next. I already mentioned security groups. Uh, within our environment, cloud team manages security groups, including central hosting and deployment. So we have a mix of role-based security groups and also custom security groups, and they are least privileged. Our, um, our port level filtering is done at the security group level, and IP level filtering is done at the on-prem firewall level, although we have a hybrid as well. Let's talk about database backups. We're not doing um, we're not doing EBS backups because everything is fully um, ephemeral, right? As I said, uh, we are using native feature of Cassandra to do a Cassandra repair and backup. This gets sent to S3, which is written through three data centers within the standard setup within a single region, right? Next. Monitoring, reliability, and performance. We have a pretty robust uh, CloudWatch dashboards with CloudWatch alarms and CloudWatch rules where we collect metrics um, on any number of things, both security and operational. On the EMR front, we're using something called Ganglia. Uh, this is where we can uh, monitor for EMR performance um, and get metrics on that. And that comes built into the EMR stack, which is hosted. All right, let's move on. All right, so what have we learned quickly? Uh, avoid falling behind with old software versions. Staying um, up to date with EMR, which is a managed piece of software, uh, was really important for us. And also um, ability to version uh, uh, in our lesser environments and use CI CD was really key. Next, let's talk about cost optimization. And I'm gonna quickly speed up because of time. Uh, we have separate environments. We're using different size clusters. We're using scaling nodes uh, where we scale up and down, in and out. We're using open source Cassandra. Obviously, that saves money. We're reducing price while testing, so uh, environments are not up 24-7. We're using S3 instead of HDFS, which can be quite expensive, and we're monitoring for all of this. We have budgets. We have other tools, Cost Explorer, or Trusted Advisor, et cetera. We also have reserve instances, saving plans, and enterprise discount program. All right, let's talk about improvements. On the improvement front, uh, we're going to be migrating, uh, looking to migrate from uh, Cassandra, which is hosted on EC2, to Key Spaces, which is a new service. We're also going to be assessing something called EMR Managed Scaling, which is automated EMR node scaling. I think it's horizontal. Uh, we are planning on reaching zero downtime for some of the upgrade tasks and migrating web app to serverless, so things like Lambda S3 API gateway. Next, so what do we achieve for users? We reduce multi-day jobs to multi-hour jobs. We unify our data format. We provide an elastic infrastructure, supervised learning of cell phenotypes, and visualization of large amounts of data. Next. So what do we achieve? Um, yeah, transition from on-prem uh, brought us uh, many things that I mentioned. Changing instance type sizes within a restart, ability to scale, redundancy, auto-recovery, 
auto scaling and mix of uh, storage types. And of course, ease of updating new versions of Spark. Next. Some things to consider. Um, earlier rather than late, aim at full automation and zero manual support. Think early about stopping AWS services and resources that are not needed. Have environments. Um, think about recovery aspects. Uh, think about operational aspects, backups, upgrades, AMI swaps, and full automation. Think about how to get the data in the most convenient way into the cloud, uh, the fastest way, without having to pay for a huge price. And use on demand and spot. Next, it's going to be our second to last slide. This is all the acknowledgments. Uh, special thanks to everyone involved, including my colleagues from Novartis, from uh, AWS. Some of these guys are still with AWS, most of them. In this case, actually all of them on, on the left slide and our consultants. Thank you so much, guys. Hopefully this was useful. Feel free to ask any questions.